From your favorite dietitian, everything you need to digest in your mind. Tips, tips, tips with Tony. Tips, tips, tips with Tony. Making you healthier one bite at a time. Tips with Tony. 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 Hello, and welcome to the Tips with Tony podcast. I'm Tony Marinucci, your registered dietitian, helping you get healthy one bite at a time. This next interview is with my great, great friend, Claire Tuning, and she is an intuitive eating dietitian. Many of you probably have heard about intuitive eating. You see the hashtags on Instagram. You've probably seen a pe- some people's profiles ex- trying to explain it. Um, but I find that it's really difficult to define, but my friend Claire does an excellent job at doing so. So I wanted to have her on here to be able to explain it to you because this, in fact, might be something that you should probably explore. Um, And after you hear the interview, if you do feel like it is something that you're interested in looking more into, please, please don't hesitate to reach out to Claire and ask her more questions. Without further ado, here is the interview with Claire Tuning, intuitive eating registered dietitian and nutrition coach. Enjoy. Hi, Claire. How are you? Hi, Tony. I'm wonderful. Thanks for having me on this morning. My pleasure. I'm so excited to have you here. Um, One, because I love you, but two, because your approach to nutrition is so unique and and so refreshing and not enough people, I think, are talking about it or even really good at it. And I know you're good at it. (laughs) Well, thank you. I'll I'll take that as a compliment. And I used to hear the word like unique and different. And I would say that's just another word for weird. (laughs) But now I really do understand that it is different and it's a very unique approach. So I'm very happy to have the opportunity to talk about it and share a little bit with your audience today. Yeah, definitely. And we're going to get into that. But before we do, I always like to ask like kind of what your background is, who you are, what you do and why you do what you do. I love it. It's kind of like one of those questions where how much time do you have? Yeah. <laughs> like, go for it. We have all the time we can go. Yeah. <laughs> um, so brief story as far as like who I am and what I do. So my name is Claire Tuning. I'm a huge fan of all things puns and peanut butter and jelly. So I'm a registered dietitian and the name of my coaching business is yours, Chewy Nutrition, which is definitely a pun 100% intended on my last name, which is tuning. So that is what I do on the day to day. I run everything in an online sense. I take clients one-on-one just like you yourself do, but a little bit as far as my background and how I got here. Um, I grew up in Southern Virginia in a wonderful, goofy, food-loving family Definitely how I ended up where I am today. I give my parents a ton of credit for how I am and for where I am now. But when I was younger, I had such a fun relationship with food. I was always cooking with my dad. I would bake with my mom. I was making, you know, cream sauce and peanut butter balls around holidays. So but at a young age, food was fun. It was creative. It was family time. It was really exploratory, which again, I'm so thankful that I did have that relationship with food growing up. My family owned restaurants. We went to the market every Saturday. We sold fish from my dad's fish farm. Like it was this whole environment where food was just the best thing ever. So this relationship with food continued up until early high school where, you know, they start to ask you the question, what do you want to do with your life? And you're like, I don't know. I'm 15. <laughs> right? like, how am I supposed to know the answer to that question? But I kind of looked back and I was like, Claire, what do you love to do? Like what really sparks your interest? And of course, growing up so closely knit to food and restaurants and cooking, my answer was, well, I love to eat. I love to talk about food and I love to cook. And I knew I didn't really want to be a chef or do anything along that line because I knew it was very intense. It was very stressful. It was those like long hours that didn't really lend to family life. So I was like, what else can I do that is along the food line? So I started doing a little bit of research. It was around the time where the internet was becoming a thing. So now I would Google and I realized that a registered dietitian was a thing that people could do where you get paid, you make a living talking about food and helping other people to understand food and love food and fuel their body. So I I learned about that and I was like, that is 
it. Like that's where I'm going. Um, so I graduated high school. I went into college. And of course, being a nutrition major, wanting to be a dietitian, I started to self-educate as any good dietitian to be would do. But I was kind of at that age again, the internet had come along. Social media was like in the beginning stages. And before I really took those initial nutrition classes, I didn't really have that kind of discerning eye to figure out what was good information versus what was bad information or not so credible information. So my first couple of years of college, I almost kind of felt like that too, I had too much information for my own good, right? It's like, I'm learning these things about nutrition. Um, certain things are good. Certain things are bad. And of course, I'm going to be a dietitian, so I have to be the picture of health. Mm. So there was a period of time over these first couple years in my college career where I went vegan. I never touched the dessert table, and I'm not bashing veganism. We know that that is a perfectly wonderful way of life if that's what you truly enjoy, right? But for me, it almost became a little bit of an obsession where I was cutting things out and I didn't really have a reason other than I was air quote vegan. I was trying to be healthy. And it kind of got to a point where when I did start learning more in my nutrition classes and in my schooling where I realized I miss those foods that I had such a good relationship with as a kid. Mm -hmm. I miss the fun. I miss the, the creativity. And I feel like again, through the self-education and the schooling, it had kind of taken me away from what had even gotten me into the career in the first place. So as I graduated from undergrad, hashtag go Dukes JMU in Harrisonburg, Virginia, shameless plug, I went off to my dietetic internship. And again, I was kind of faced with this version of nutrition that is very needed in some cases, but it was very clinical. It was very numbers focused. It was very weight loss focused. And I realized this isn't really why I got into the field. Again, every dietitian is needed. Every dietitian is there to help someone. But I was like, Claire, this version of nutrition that you're learning in school isn't really what sets your heart on fire. It's not what you want to do. And it's kind of the version of nutrition that in some way, shape, or form got you to a more negative place in a relationship with food than a positive one. So around that time, I was very serendipitous. I came across the Intuitive Eating book um, by Evelyn Triboli and Elise Resch. If anyone who is listening has not heard of the book, has not read it, I would definitely recommend it. But I read that book and I was like, oh my goodness, this book gives me words, it gives me a framework, it gives me scientific studies to back up the relationship that I naturally had with food as a kid that brought me into this career in the first place. I have to do this when I get my RD credential. Mm. So flash forward, graduated from the internship, and I became the intuitive eating dietitian. I started educating myself on all the things I didn't learn in school. It's like, okay, I have all this knowledge of nutrition, but how do I take it and help people step away from the scale? How do I take it and help people improve their relationship with food? And of course, learn about nutrition or gentle nutrition as we call it, but not let it cross that line where it starts to become an obsession or something that takes over their mental health in a negative way. So that is kind of in a nutshell how I got to where I am now and why I do what I do, which is intuitive eating coaching. Yeah. It's crazy. It's so natural to you. Like it's like everything. And I, uh, one thing I'm super jealous about is also like, I know that you're part of a family of entrepreneurs yes. and like everyone in your family is an entrepreneur. And it's just so crazy. Um, I know this is like separate kind of what we're talking about, but just like who you surround yourself with is like who you become, right? Like your whole entire life, you had this positive relationship with food because you're with people who had a positive relationship of it. And not for nothing, a lot of people that go into dietetics go in because they have a history of a poor relationship with food. Because I mean, me personally, I grew up overweight. Like we were trying to figure it out on our own and we still don't really know. And it can be, I, I did the same thing. I was vegetarian. Then I was vegan. I was taking, go, you know, you're learning you're like what do I believe like what's right. happening right and it's just so crazy that I think that's so amazing that like what I took from that is like you are who you surround yourself with and I Absolutely. love that you are constantly giving out like positive messages and a different and a unique approach that most people don't see and I think they they need that support to remind them like because we're so saturated by the internet of like all the kind of like 
you know, drop 20 pounds in two weeks and do all these. And it's just like, no, that's probably not like really what I want, but that's what the internet's saying. And that's what I'm surrounding myself with and saturating my information and my brain with. So now I feel like that's what I need to do. Right. So, yeah. yeah. And there really, there really is so much to be said for who you surround yourself with. And flashback to a couple of moments ago where I said that I credit my parents really for a lot of, of how I ended up where I am, not only because they were like, yeah, nutrition, go in that direction. And they helped support me to get here. But I was really, from that early age, I had that picture of what it was like to do what I do now, to have an easeful and a natural and the relationship with food that we were all born having. Like, it's Mm -hmm. so weird to me because the older that I get and the more I get into what it is that I do now, I look back on my childhood or things that my parents allowed me to do or set me up to do. And I was like, they didn't know it, but they were grooming an intuitive eating dietitian. Like, Mm -hmm. because I had this experience from a young age. So yes, The schooling was incredible and it helped me and I'm so grateful for my credential, but a lot of it was also from how I lived from an early age, which is really so cool how it kind of intertwines in that way. 100%. I love that. Um, And so one thing you mentioned also too, and I feel like this is something to really talk about. Um, I think a lot of people when they start their health journey or when they are trying to like cut out or restrict foods, they intentionally do go vegan. And I notice that a lot. It's very much, it just makes it easier for them to say like, no, I can't have that. Um, do you find that very often? I know that I've read about it and I know that I've personally experienced it and I have seen it before. And like you said, there's nothing wrong with being vegan. Like if that's, if it's a value to you for a specific Mm -hmm. reason, but is that something that like something someone should pay attention to? Like if they're going vegan or vegetarian, is it actually for health reasons or is it more of an excuse to avoid certain foods? Yeah, absolutely. So something that I talk to my clients a lot about because they know I'm not the dietitian, neither are you the type of dietitian who is going to tell someone exactly what to eat Mm -hmm. or what not to eat. Because I truly and honestly believe that our food behaviors and our food decisions are some of the most intimate and personal decisions that we make on a daily basis. So I'm not going to come out and say, no, don't do that. Don't be vegan. But something that I do encourage anyone and everyone, whether it's someone who I work with personally, whether it's a family member, someone who's listening to this podcast, is if you are thinking of making a shift or a change that is rather drastic, like let's say you've never been vegan before, or you've never been vegetarian, and in doing so, you're cutting out a lot of the foods that you enjoy or that are staples in your diet, I want you to get really clear on the intention behind that. Mm -hmm. Is your intention to support an ethical or a moral belief that you truly and honestly believe in? If that is 100% your intention, that is fine. And I will help you find ways to make your food nourishing and satisfying to align with those beliefs. Mm -hmm. But if you ask yourself, why am I doing this in really the underlying motive or message behind that intention is to have a reason or an excuse to cut out foods that are higher in calories or that are more fatty in nature or that have animal products in them, maybe that have been demonized by the media. Mm -hmm. Like if that is the intention is to restrict without someone kind of raising an eyebrow and being like, why are you doing that? Right. And you can just say, Oh, I'm vegan or I'm vegetarian. Like it's easier to say that then um, that's where we kind of need to be like, okay, is this really the right decision for me or is there something else going on? Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, Okay. So we, you kind of touched on it a little bit, um, but I think intuitive eating I think it's hard when in society we want such like a black and white answer. And I know intuitive eating is kind of vague. Like it's kind of like, it doesn't really have a clear definition, but I know if anyone's going to give us a good definition, it's going to be you. (laughs) So if you could explain what exactly like in a couple sentences, like what is intuitive eating? Yeah, sure. This is a question that I get a fair amount and I can kind of tell people are like, okay, Claire, like what do you do? (laughs) Like, what do you actually do? Like, okay, you say intuitive eating, but what does that mean? Because you're so right that if you Google intuitive eating, or if you look up the hashtag intuitive eating, you get a lot of different responses and a lot of different answers. So the best way 
that I know how to describe it in the most straightforward sense is intuitive eating is a non-numbers-based approach to health and nutrition that is really designed to help individuals, both men and women, to recover from the chronic negative, both physical, mental, and emotional effects of dieting. So physically, we know that long-term restriction or or dieting can decrease metabolic rate. Um, Mentally, we know that it can make us obsessive over food. It can make us, you know, like we were talking about with veganism for the wrong reasons, it can make us become obsessive over food and really restrict the foods that we love, which come at the expense of our mental health. Emotionally or socially, maybe it distances us from our family members and our friends. And instead of enjoying that time with them that we only get once, right? We never get that back. We're thinking about food and nutrition and weight instead. So that is kind of my in a nutshell answer as to what intuitive eating is, but it really does entail finding out how to reconnect with those innate cues and senses that we have around food from the time that we were born. Because when we were babies, we knew how to moderate our intake based on what we needed for growth. We knew how to be like, hey, caretaker, like, hey, mom or dad, I'm hungry, so I'm crying, I need food. We knew when we needed to stop or when we felt full. We knew how to feel satisfied. So as we get older, I always like to reassure people that we don't lose those behaviors. We don't lose those abilities. We just kind of get distanced from them from years of feeling like we have to look to numbers for answers or we have to look to a specific diet. So it really is a process of regaining trust and regaining knowledge that I do know how to fuel my body. Like what does my hunger even feel like to me? What type of foods feel satisfying and feel good in my own body? Um, How do I want to nourish myself so that I enjoy my life? Like what does my fullness feel like? How do I use food? So it's kind of asking all of these questions to get a bigger answer to health and nutrition than just follow this meal plan, eat these foods, don't eat these foods and report back to me in two weeks. Like it really is kind of recovering the relationship to food that we've had from the time that we were born. Right. So, and you just said something that made me think of a question that I get very often. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot of like, should I have three meals a day? Should I have one meal a day? You know, how, I, I guess kind of going back to you're saying like, yes, as a child, we have hunger cues. We know when to stop eating when we're full, but we've also been ignoring them for a majority of your life, if you've been a, if you've been a yo-yo dieter, you know, or you're someone who doesn't eat all day long and then you get home and then you raid the cabinets and cause you didn't eat. And so, but you're like, but no, but I, I'm not hungry for breakfast. Like, I feel like, like, how do you handle something like that? Because I mean, I, I'm, yeah, I have, I have like how I do it, but I'm curious from an intuitive eating approach, like how would you handle someone that comes to you that says, you're telling me to eat when I'm hungry and stuff when I'm full, but I'm literally not hungry all day. Mm -hmm. And I think this speaks to the individuality of what I do largely, like big time, because my response to this question would really depend on the individual's past and their behavior surrounding food. So if they're coming out of a very restrictive time in their life, maybe it was more of an eating disorder um, where they've been very restrictive of their intake, or maybe they've been on a diet that preached disordered eating habits where they've been largely undernourishing or underfueling themselves. Well, we know in those cases that our natural air quote, natural hunger cues are going to be depressed because the body has learned, Oh, here she isn't feeding me. So I'm going to stop sending signals because I have to conserve my energy to keep my vital organs going. So we know in those cases, hunger cues are naturally going to be decreased. So we can't really rely on them or trust how they're coming up now because we've trained them to show up less often than we need them to. So in those cases, I really give the advice to eat something regularly because you and I both know that no matter what type of nutrition plan you prescribe to, we have to eat sufficiently. Like we have to eat regularly because we can't expect our bodies to run on eat. Like if you were to go out to your car and it was empty, you wouldn't say, hey car, push through for the next five hours of this road trip. You would say, hey, I have to go get gas. So one suggestion that I have for people who maybe don't have those normal or regular hunger cues because they're suppressed is to eat something or drink something. Maybe it's a protein shake. Like many people find that if the hunger cues aren't there, that drinking something, maybe a protein shake, a smoothie, 
every three to four hours just to kind of re-regulate your body's cues to get you eating enough so that eventually your body will learn, hey, there is food available. We can start showing these hunger cues because we know when we add more food, we kind of stoke the fire and eventually our body will start asking for more food. So that's what I say to kind of the, the past restrictive individual. If it's someone who's coming to me and they haven't necessarily been restrictive. Maybe they've been eating sufficiently, but they've been eating more out of habit or the time on the clock rather than out of intention of listening to their body. My response is, hey, if you're genuinely not hungry when you first wake up, you don't have to eat breakfast because it's 9 a.m. Maybe take a snack with you. Maybe take something like your smoothie or a protein shake that is easy to eat. And right when you do notice those initial hunger cues surface, eat that as soon as you can. So again, it really just depends on the person and the individual, but that's kind of like my 10,000 foot view answer. Yeah, no, but that's perfect. That's exactly kind of, yeah, we're on the same page. That's good. (laughs) That's really good. And yeah, it's always about individualization. I think that's the biggest thing that um, so many people want to know the answer, but like, if we don't know your background or anything, it's, 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 in, it's, you know, I'll go, I say it all the time. Nutritionist is not black and white. It's very gray. It's very gray. I kind of want to make it a different color though. What's like a prettier color? <laughs> What's a more exciting it color? Like, like a mix. It could be like nutrition is not white or red. It's pink. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or I just thought of like green and red. Would green and red makes purple or blue? What is green? <laughs> LOL. How many degrees does it take to figure out what the color wheel makes? I didn't major in art for a reason, but what did you say? Red and green? I'm pretty sure red and green make blue, right? I think so. Because red and blue make purple. Yeah, red and blue make, so yeah. So we're going to say it's blue. Nutrition is blue. <laughs> If anyone who does art is listening to this podcast, they're like, oh my word, stick to me. Write it down right now because I need, I need to know. <laughs> Must know answers. I need to know when we get off of here and when I do the intro and outro, I might tell everybody that we're <laughs> not nutrition experts, but we're not art experts. <laughs> I love it. Um, okay. So this is also super, super good. So um, I love this so much. You mentioned already kind of like the non-scale approach. So what do you, how do you handle someone who's really obsessed with getting on that scale? And, you know, maybe they are like, I'm, I know that you help people who we're going to talk more about this later, but like who are recovering from an eating disorder who may be underweight versus someone who might be very overweight and just has a poor relationship with food. So what do you do with that person that really does want to lose weight? Um, but you're telling them to not get on the scale. Right. So I I see this a lot. Um, A lot of people come to me saying, Claire, I love what you do. Like intuitive eating, I can get on board or at least one foot of mine can be in the boat. The other foot might be in the other boat, which is dieting in the active pursuit of weight loss. So Mm -hmm. the thing that I like to say first and foremost, oh, sorry, I was getting a call. Um, The thing (laughs) that I like to say first and foremost is if someone is in the boat of wanting to pursue weight loss or lose weight, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, One thing that I feel like intuitive eating gets a bad rap for is being anti-health or anti-weight loss. That is not the case because I am all about promoting healthy behaviors that are shown to increase levels of health, like having a healthy relationship with food, moving your body in a way that you enjoy, taking rest, drinking water, things like that. I'm all about promoting health, healthy behaviors. I'm also about not, let's do it this way. I'm about not taking something too far. Does that kind of make sense? So if we're, if we're thinking about, sorry, so many things were going off in my computer and it was a wee bit distracting. So um, when it comes to weight loss, what I like to say is again, you're not wrong for wanting to lose weight because if we look at all of the messages that we receive in society nowadays, it's eat these foods to be this size or eat these foods to lose this amount of weight. And again, I do not live in anyone else's body. So if someone comes to me saying, hey, I agree with your message, but I still want to lose weight. I always validate and say, I don't know how it feels to be in your body. It's okay to feel that way because these are the messages that we have received. However, I am here to say that you can pursue a version of health. Again, increasing those health promoting behaviors like I was just speaking of, you can pursue health without focusing on weight or without making health or weight rather the marker of your success. Because what I find a lot of the times when people are trying to 
promote health or trying to gain healthier behaviors in their life and they're still focusing very heavily on the weight is that the scale kind of gets in the way of doing these health promoting behaviors. For example, maybe they get on the scale and they see a number that they like and they say, great, I've done something good. I can celebrate with food today, right? And there's nothing wrong with celebrating with food. Going back to my story about how I got into nutrition in the first place, I love celebrating with food. I love eating cake on my birthday, doing all of these things. But maybe if you hadn't have even stepped on that scale in the first place and identified yourself as good because the number went down, you wouldn't have even thought more about food that day other than when you were hungry or when you felt that you needed to eat. Mm -hmm. On the flip side, if someone steps on the scale and maybe this happens a little bit more often or what I talk about more often with my clients is they see a number that they don't like, or maybe it was one that they weren't going for. And then we kind of get into the shame spiral. It's how did I get here? It's, you know, I'm trying to be healthy. And then it really turns into what do I need to restrict from the rest of my day to get the number back into the air quote, good range. Or how much do I need to move my body to get back into that air quote, good range. So my perspective on the scale, um, my personal perspective and what I preach to my clients is no matter which way you spin it, no matter if you're hopping on there and you see something air quote, good or bad, no matter which way you spin it, it can result in negative behaviors around food movement and self-talk. So my perspective that I preach to all of my clients is let's focus on the habits. Let's focus on these health promoting behaviors that have been shown to increase levels of health rather than getting stuck in the conversation of I have to lose weight and I'm actively pursuing weight loss because so often that results in that hamster wheel or that spiral of letting the number get in the way of the healthy behaviors. Does that make sense? Totally. Totally. I think the, the main thing is it's the way the person's reacting to it. And either way, they're, util- they're forgetting about all of the great things that they maybe have done. Maybe they started incorporating breakfast. Maybe they've been mindful of, you know, not, you know, breaking that over under eating cycle and they're consistently eating nutritious foods while leaving a little bit of room for things that they enjoy. Like, and they've made all these progress and yet now the scale says one thing and now they forget all about that and then they react to it in a negative way yeah so I think that's really really great and I think it's really helpful and I think also too like naturally if someone's listening to their body and fueling their body properly and using the barriers and you know that you kind of give them in the guidelines to help them fuel their body the way that their body is asking to be fueled I think naturally then you know although the goal is not weight loss I feel like People probably have like, maybe they're not getting on the scale, but maybe their clothes fit better. They just feel better. And overall their health is better. And so therefore it's like, let's just focus on the health aspect and then allow that to kind of come. Yeah. Is that fair to say? Yeah. What you said with those last couple of sentences is so true. It's let's focus on the behaviors. Let's focus on those things that again are shown to promote health, whether it's drinking enough water, whether it's sleeping enough, whether it's reducing stress around mealtime or figuring out a movement practice that you do enjoy, or maybe it's just giving your body enough rest instead of moving all the time. What we say is let's focus on the behaviors and we'll let the weight do what it needs to do. Mm -hmm. Because this thing that I like to say again, and this is the conversation I have with all of my clients when it comes to the conversation of weight and intuitive eating, is intuitive eating is a truly weight neutral practice. Meaning we do not have full control over how we show up in the world. We know that we are born into this world with a certain set of genetics that dictates a fair amount of how we show up physically, maybe in a smaller body more naturally, we may be in a larger body more naturally, and to a certain extent, We don't really have control over that because if you and I, for example, ate the same exact foods and moved our bodies in the same exact way, we'd still look like two completely different human beings because we are, Mm -hmm. right? Um, So the thing about intuitive eating is it's weight neutral, meaning some people may heal the relationship to food and heal the relationship to their hunger, fullness, satiety cues, and they may stay the exact same size that they have been for the majority of their life. And that's okay. Other people may come into intuitive eating, especially if they're coming from that very restrictive mindset, like we were talking about a few moments ago, 
they may need to gain weight for their body to trust them in situations around food and to be healthy because we also know that being underweight or being undersized is very unhealthy for our body. It's unhealthy for our heart. It's unhealthy for our organs, for our bones, things like that. And on the flip side, someone may come into the intuitive eating path and maybe their body size will decrease or they will lose weight. But what I'm trying to say here is whatever the weight does, whether it stays, whether we gain, whether we lose, that's not the main focus, but rather to focus on the behaviors to support one's health and longevity throughout the rest of their life. So does that kind of make sense? Totally. Absolutely. Um, and then as you were speaking, one thing that kind of spoke to me is I feel like a lot of people who come to you probably have really poor, um, self body image. Like they probably even no matter what weight they actually end up at, maybe they still on a mental level still need to improve that. Um, do you find like, is that something within your scope or do they usually go to therapy for that? Like, how do you help someone heal their, that, um, maybe like body dysmorphia, right? Like they're at, they think you're telling them to gain weight. They look in the mirror and they're like, what are you talking about? Right. Or they, or they have just, um, not telling them to gain weight, but like, you know, the approaches, you know, that they're Mm -hmm. underweight and they need to feel better. Um, but in, in general, like I'm wondering how do you handle that? Cause I feel like that's definitely tied into that a lot. Right. And this is a conversation again, that I have with all of my clients at some point, because you know, as well as I do, when we're talking about food and how we move our bodies and what we put into our bodies, we are going to have to have the conversation about how we perceive ourselves or how we view ourselves. So again, it kind of comes back to the initial answer I had to your earlier question. It really depends on the individual in their background. So I think we can both agree or everyone who is listening can agree that some of us, depending on what we have been through in our relationship with food and our bodies and movement, some of us may need more help and may need more people in their corner to come to a, a better place with this, right? So in certain cases, many of my clients do work with other professionals. They do work with a body image coach or a therapist of some sort because my main job is the food. Of course, we talk about things like weight. We talk about things like body image because it comes with the territory. But if I'm ever sensing that there needs to be someone else in the picture, I am definitely someone who says, hey, what's wrong with having multiple people, multiple helpers in your corner to help you over this hump, right? To get you to a better place in your life. But one conversation that I have with all of my clients that may be helpful to someone who is listening is a conversation of body neutrality. So I talk about body image kind of like it's on a sliding scale, much like the hunger scale I talk about. So if we're talking about it on a scale, it ranges from one to 10. One or the lower end of the scale would be body hatred, body disgust, really not appreciating, not liking at all anything that we are feeling or anything that we are seeing in our reflection in the mirror. On the other end of the scale, a 10 would be body positivity. It's I love my body. My body is not an apology. Like all of these things in this wonderful movement on social media that we are seeing, that is the other end of the scale. Of course, we want to be as close to that as possible, but I find it a rather disingenuine or too large of a jump to take someone who is on the lower end of the scale and say, Hey, just love yourself or (laughs) just love your body. Right. Because then when I call BS meter is going to be going off in the back of your head because you can say things like, I believe in the power of affirmations, but if they're too stark of a contrast from what you've been living in for years or for months, then it's not going to be that helpful. So What I try to encourage my clients to do or what I try to bring them into is the middle part of the scale, which is body neutrality. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about body neutrality, we're looking at the functionality of the body over how we appear or over how it looks. So a really good example that I like to give that I've done with many of my clients is focusing on the stomach. Because many of us, especially if it's in the summer season and we are wearing naturally more exposing clothing that may expose a part of the body, aka the stomach that's not normally exposed in the winter, we may be looking at our stomachs and sliding down on that body awareness scale, saying things like, I hate my stomach. It's too big. It's X, Y, and Z. Insert whatever thing we may have said here. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, it's okay if you're feeling that way, but what is something neutral that we can say that focuses on the function? So for example, 
I have a stomach, like check the box. Yes, you do. There's a neutral statement. And thank goodness it digests the food that I give it. And I know that sometimes feeling bloated, feeling uncomfortable is simply a consequence of digesting certain foods. And it's feedback that my body is giving me. So you kind of see what I did there. Instead of using polarizing terms like hate, love, good, bad, I say, hey, it's digesting. It is a stomach. Thank goodness that I can eat and digest the food that I can. So that mm. is something that I try to train with my clients as much as I can is how can we step into the neutral realm? And then from there, we can kind of go up to body respect, um, body acceptance, and then body positivity. But we really have to start training in the neutral realm. And then of course, if they're like, Claire, this still isn't working. I need someone else in my corner. Then working with another professional is something that is so incredibly appropriate. Absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. This is really great. I feel like anybody who listens to this is going to have a lot of light bulbs going off. (laughs) I hope so. so. For real. Yeah. Um, So we're going to wrap up, but um, you, I did also want to touch on this. Like you're also a yoga instructor, right? Uh Yep. When did you start that? I started teaching yoga. Oh boy. Five or six years ago, I believe it was. Um, so it's been a minute with the yoga. I've been a yoga yeah. teacher longer than I've uh, been a dietitian. So yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. Mm-hmm. Now, do you find that they go hand in hand? Most definitely, because if um, I'll go like semi yoga teacher on here on yeah. you here for like two seconds. Um, this is the word yoga itself. Many words in yoga are Sanskrit in origin. Um, so the word yoga itself means to yoke, or it means a union. So if we think about all the unions happening in a yoga practice, it's the union of our movement and our breath. It's the union of our body and our mind and our spirit and all of these things that are happening on the mat. So if we look at what intuitive eating is doing, it's really bringing ourselves back into union with food, bringing ourselves back into a harmonious relationship with our body's cues and how things feel in our embodied experience. So again, I didn't necessarily get into yoga thinking one day I'm going to be an intuitive eating dietitian. This is going to fit so well, but I feel like the stars kind of aligned in this way because so many of the practices or the affirmations or the meditative practices of yoga really do play into what I do and what I talk about, at least to some extent with my clients. So it's very cool in that way. Totally. I love it. Yeah. You're not doing anything by accident. No. Your whole life is like just perfect. The stars have a line for sure. (laughs) I love it. Um, Okay. So I always also like to ask, like if someone's listening and they're like, I feel like this is someone that could really help me, but I'm like not 100% 100 sure. Like if you could maybe give an example of a personal like client, like what they came to you with, how you've helped them where they are now. I'd love to hear from that. And then following up on that, like really try to explain like who you, when you work one-on-one with someone, like who is your program for and like, who is it not for? Mm -hmm. So I work with people from many different disordered eating backgrounds, but something that I feel like will resonate maybe a lot with your audience or just the general majority of people out there. Um, I do work with many individuals who have done something like, a weight loss program or a macro tracking or a calorie based program. And to a certain extent, maybe it worked for them for that time in their life, but they've gotten to a place where those behaviors and that obsession or that emphasis on the number on the scale or the macros on my fitness pal has gotten to a place where it is no longer healthy. And those behaviors are coming at more of an expense of one's mental, social, emotional health rather than improving one's physical health. Um, So I take people, many people come to me, they fill out my application and they say, I love all the things you're talking about. I want to learn to nourish my body in a way that doesn't involve numbers. I don't want to focus on weight loss anymore. I simply want to be able to go out to dinner and enjoy myself without looking at the menu beforehand, unless I have an allergy, of course, right? I want to be able to go out on the town with my friends and be there fully present without worrying about how many crunches I have to do the next morning to work off what I've done or without worrying about reporting to my fitness pal, how many tacos I ate. Right. So it really is these people seeing that there is another side to nutrition that is non-numbers focused. that is healing the relationship to food that we were all born with, but they don't necessarily know how to get there. They say, Claire, I love your message. I I understand, 
but all of the steps to get me from where I am now to how you talk or how your clients talk, they're kind of fuzzy to me. So that is really what I do. I help take people from a life of chronic dieting, or maybe even it's only been a couple of months, but maybe that period of time has really served to damage the relationship with food. And we create a roadmap and a program for them to make food more than a number, to bring them back into harmony and connectedness with their own body to move their body out of freedom, out of enjoyment, rather than out of restriction, Mm -hmm. and to really get them to that place where they see food. And it's a gut reaction of, yay, I'm excited, nourishment, fuel, rather than, ugh, I have to track this, or how many numbers is that? Mm -hmm. So that is really an example of who I work with. Um, Kind of to your second question of who the program is not for, because I feel like I just outlined who it is for, for sure. But it's definitely not for anyone who is still looking to actively track weight or actively track macros or anyone who is coming to a dietitian saying, hey, I want you to tell me exactly what to eat and exactly what not to eat. Like if you're looking for prescriptive nutrition, if you're looking for an exact meal plan or a workout plan or a calorie target or a weight target to hit, I'm simply not going to be your dietitian. I have many other friends and colleagues who would be good fits for that, but that is simply not what I do. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. All right. Well, I, yeah, I love everything that you do. Where can people find you if they are interested in working with you one-on-one? You also have a Facebook group, right? I do just like yourself. Yeah. So tell us more about your Facebook group and if someone wants to work with you one-on-one. So my Facebook community is called the yours truly goal slayers. Um, it is a private community, but it is free and open for anyone to join. So if anyone is listening to this and they're like, I want more information, I have daily posts. I do live videos every Thursday, all of my clients chat it up in there. If you want to see what it's like to work with me, um, you can simply search the yours truly goal slayers on Facebook hit request to join and I will send you the application so that A, I know a bit more about you and B, I can kind of lay some ground rules as far as what the community is about. Um, So that is a Facebook community. Would love to have anyone who is listening and wants more information. If you're like, uh, it sounds great, but I want to work with you immediately, Claire. Like, I don't need the Facebook group. <laughs> well, that is exciting. Um, what you can do in that case is you can find me on Instagram at Claire Tuning. The link to my one on one coaching application lives in my bio there. Um, there is a brief application that is about eight to 10 questions that I will have you fill out so that we can hop on a call to determine if you are a good fit for what I do. Um, You can also find that application if you're not on social media by just going to clairetuning.com and there's a work with me tab. So that's how you find us. Awesome. Well, I always put the IG link in the uh, show notes and it'll be tagged on the podcast um, Tipsy Tony page. So people will be able to find you there. But um, yeah, I mean, thank you so much. Is there anything else you want to add or... I don't think I have anything else along the intuitive eating lines, but I think a big thank you is in order for anyone who is listening. I didn't actually end up mentioning my podcast, but that's the yours podcast. But if anybody wants to find Tony, (laughs) her interview and shedding some light on what she does, I believe she was my first episode at the beginning of 2019. So you can find that on the yours truly podcast. And thank you so much for having me and being one of my original dietitian friends in the social media world. <laughs> yeah, for real. We go way back. We do. We do. It, actually, it's been like a year. We when were we in Vegas together for the for the conference? That was a year ago. I think it was a year ago on this date actually. Like when we were recording, yeah, I think it was- <laughs> It definitely was. Yeah, it definitely was. Yeah. Well, did you plan it this way? No. So cool. So, so cool. Um, Well, are you going to go, are you going to be in Arizona? Yep. I will be in Arizona. Yes, I will be at Fancy. That will be the one week of like all of us spending an entire week together because Fancy runs until Tuesday and then we all meet up in Tempe on that Friday. So it will be a lot of all of us in one sitting. I'm so excited. Yeah. So I'm going to see a ton of you in like two months. Super excited. Um, but obviously we'll be seeing each other via social. Thank you so much for coming on. And I look forward to watching you like help this world just develop a healthier relationship with food. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tony. Bye. <laughs> Bye. 
Wow. I hope you guys found that super helpful, super informative, and something that you are going to maybe apply some of what she said into your lifestyle. Super, super great stuff. Also, just wanted to note, green and red makes brown. I just looked it up, and now it's all coming back to me, remembering learning colors in the fifth grade. I was actually in art enrichment in the fifth grade, if any of you guys don't know what that is, but basically it just, you know, it was like for people who are a little bit extra good at art and needed to be challenged with their creativity. So the fact that I forgot that is really sad. (laughs) Um, But yes, we have to come up with another color. You know, I'm trying to think of something where, cause nutrition, yeah, it is, it is gray. It is mute. It is a little bit, um, but it's not, it's not boring. It's exciting. However, it is a mixture of things. It's not so clear. So it's not black and white. Um, It's not like all foods are good and then all foods are bad. So maybe we should use, maybe Claire's color was pink. It was like red and white. I'm not sure. We're going to put a pin in that and come back. (laughs) Um, Anyways, guys, thanks so much for listening. As always, I'm Tony Marinucci, your registered dietitian, helping you get healthy one bite at a time.